Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors, episode 41. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. As always, I'd like to begin by thanking the wonderful patrons who continue to support this podcast. I'm so very grateful for your encouragement and generosity. A full list of patrons is available on my website under the Patrons tab. If you love Talking Tudors and would like to show your appreciation and support the work I do, just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tutors patron family and you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways, as well as receiving some other wonderful perks. July's prize is a copy of Unleash Your Inner Tudor, Henry VIII's inspirational guide to a completely sizzling, sparkly, tyrannical, much wider, demanding and sexier you by none other than Henry VIII, also known as Andy Dembski. A huge thank you to Andy for sponsoring this wonderful prize. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about her book, Black Tudors, is Dr. Miranda Kaufman. Dr. Kaufman is the author of the critically acclaimed book, Black Tudors, The Untold Story. She's a senior research fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, part of the School of Advanced Study, University of London, where she's been co-convening the popular What's Happening in Black British History series with Michael Ohajuru since 2014. She's also an honorary fellow of the University of Liverpool and a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Miranda read history at Christchurch, Oxford, where she completed her doctoral thesis on Africans in Britain, 1500 to 1640 in 2011, and where she also won two blues for rugby. Miranda is currently conducting research towards her next book, Eris's The Caribbean Marriage Trade. My conversation with Dr. Kaufman straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sayles. Welcome to Talking Tudors, Miranda. How are you? 
I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you. Uh, I thought I thought we could begin by you just introducing yourself to our listeners and maybe just telling us a little bit about your background. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Miranda, uh, Dr. Miranda Kaufman. Um, I'm a historian. I, my first book, Black Tudors, came out back in 2017, which was based on my doctoral research at Oxford. I, my thesis was um, called Africans in Britain, 1500 to 1640. So we got a snappier title for the, yeah. for the book. Um, I'm also a senior research fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies in London, uh, where I co-organise a series with my colleague Michael Ohjuru called "What's Happening in Black British History." Uh, so I'm I'm really interested in in that more broadly and getting that um, taught and having a kind of people being m- more aware of the fact that there've been black people in Britain since Roman period. Uh, so Black Tudors is only a kind of part of that longer story. Uh, I've recently been working with some school teachers uh, to get Black Tudors into the classroom, uh, and I seem to have a million other things. That I'm doing <laughs> yes. Well. yes, and I, I want to ask you about the school project a little bit later on. But um, so, have you always been interested in Tudor history, or is this something sort of fairly new? Oh no, it goes pretty far back. Um, I suppose it. I suppose my. I you know my. Well, my parents always took me to lots of historic sites and museums, so I was always interested in history in general. Um, and I was first taught the Tudors when I was about nine uh, at primary school, and we. I had a really great history teacher, and I remember her sitting on the edge of her desk in the afternoon, telling us stories from history and. I remember her telling us about Elizabeth I and Henry VIII and the singeing of the King of Spain's beard wow. uh, by this <laughs> Drake and all that. So, so yeah, it, it goes pretty far back. And also, I used to watch loads of history films with my dad as well, like Young Bess or Anne of a Thousand Days or all these sort of Tudor dramas. So, so I, yeah, it's 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 it runs deep. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned your book, Black Tudors, The Untold Story. I'd love to hear a little bit more about this particular book. And also, maybe if you could just share with us why you felt this was a book that needed to be written. Uh, Well, like I said, the book came out of my doctorate. So when I was researching, you know, I was really surprised to find out there were Africans um, living in Tudor England. And uh, you know, put a lot of hard work into finding them. So then I wanted everyone to know about it. (laughs) Um, I I found records of sort of over 360 individuals living here between uh, 1500 and 1640. That's in England and Scotland. Uh, And so I I wanted the world to know. Um, But also I think it's really important, um, well, firstly because it happened, but also um, because we we quite often have quite a narrow vision of Tudor history. We get Mm. sort of caught up with the admittedly very dramatic and entertaining um, history, personal lives of, of, of mostly of Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. Um, but actually, uh, this was a period where England was beginning to develop a relationship with the wider world. England's English history at this period is very tied up with this rivalry of Spain, but because the Spanish Empire is already an empire on which the sun never sets, you know, the English are are uh, getting involved in that and uh, people like Francis Drake are, are sailing to the Caribbean for example to raid Spanish ports so it's not just a Eurocentric story uh, but also um, you know in, in Britain today unfortunately you know we have a very vituperative immigration debate going on and I think a lot of people who uh, want to, <laughs> want various people to go back where they came from unfortunately yes. that's a yeah very familiar line at the moment thanks mm. to what's going on in America uh, you know those people quite often assume that immigration is a very modern phenomenon that it in, in England there's a sort of obsession with the wind rush uh, which was a ship that docked here from the Caribbean in 1948 and there's often this sort of assumption that that immigration was really just a 20th century phenomenon and that the Tudor period was uh, lily white uh, and it wasn't so I think I think it's really important to to show people this kind of long history of immigration um, in our island and um, so hopefully sort of change their perspectives on that. Absolutely and could you tell us a little bit about how Africans actually came to be in Tudor England? Yeah so as I was saying it's partly to do with our relationship with with Spain but 
uh, in the so in the middle of the 16th century, uh, English merchants start trading with Africa for the first time. Uh, initially with Morocco, and the, but then quite quickly going down the coast of West Africa to Guinea uh, and and other parts of West Africa. They first go to South Africa uh, at the beginning of the 17th century, uh, or sort of on the way to the East Indies with these sort of first East India Company voyages. Um, and so when they go to Africa, they bring um, Africans back to England, teach them English, uh, usually in London, and then take them back to where they, ca- they came from to act as um, trade factors and interpreters, uh, because obviously they need to be able to communicate with the, with the African merchants. Uh, and at that point, they're, they're tending to buy things like they want gold, ivory, a kind of special kind of pepper called Malagueta pepper that was very uh, abundant in what was called the Grain Coast. Uh, and and so that's the sort of first route. And then um, because the Spanish and Portuguese were, you know, or, already had this empire, as I said, um, they there was a lot, a, a much higher proportion of uh, African people in South Southern Europe than there was in Northern Europe. Uh, some parts of sort of Southern Spain, like Seville, had sort of had up to, or, or or Lisbon in Portugal had sort of almost ten percent of a black population. Right. So. Uh, when merchants came to uh, England from Portugal or Spain or sometimes from parts of Italy, uh, they sometimes brought Africans with them in their households. Uh, and that's also true for sort of monarchs. So when Catherine of Aragon comes over to marry Prince Arthur in 1501 or when Philip II of Spain comes over to marry Mary Tudor, they both have Africans in their entourage. And then the third way is is through privateering. So as I was saying people like Francis Drake, but also like huge amounts of other lesser known individuals. Uh, it was much, you get a much quicker profit uh, than if you, in, than in traditional trade, if you took a privateering ship. So privateering is different from piracy, only that in that uh, you have an official letter from the king or the queen saying that it's okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and the, the logic is, it, it usually happens when uh, England is, is at war with another country, but England was at war with Spain for quite a long period. Yes. <laughs> so the idea being that, you know, say, the Spanish had already captured some English merchandise, so it was totally fine to go and capture their ships uh, and take it back. Uh, and also, um, you know, Drake actually sort of starts raiding Spanish ports in the Caribbean as well as part of a broader strategy to sort of win the war against Spain. So again, uh, because the Spaniards have been and Portuguese have been taking Africans across the Atlantic to work in their colonies since the early 16th century, uh, when uh, the English capture Spanish or Portuguese ships or um, raid Spanish ports in South America and the Caribbean, uh, then they're quite likely to encounter Africans and quite often um, quite a few Africans then come back to England in that way. So those are the three main ways. Yeah, thank you so much for that. So how were they actually treated by the communities, like when they're living in England? Do we have much information about that? Uh, well, not as much as I'd like. No. <laughs> uh, but I think um, we can see quite a lot from the way that they're treated um, by the church, for example. So right. there are quite a few Africans. I think I found at least 66 Africans uh, who were baptised uh, in the period. <laughs> Uh, and then there's a few who get married and, you know, various others that, you know, receive Christian burial. So they're accepted as sort of equals in the eyes of God uh, into the parish community, uh, which is quite powerful because it's such a, a religious period. Everybody, you know, be- really believes or at least has to appear to be believing uh, in the Protestant faith. So accepting Africans into that is quite significant, especially when we look at later periods um, when that was not a given at all. Uh, and actually, sort of when you when you get to sort of the 18th century British um, slave colonies, that uh, the enslavers are very resistant to baptising the mm. enslaved uh, because it's sort of tied up with ideas of freedom. So, so these baptisms, I think, are, are highly significant. Um, and, and also, in, and you know, we can also see, you know, that these Africans are being paid wages, uh, so they're sort of being valued in that way. 
they're allowed to testify in court. Right. So they have that kind of citizen status of you know, being witnesses in, in trials. So so they, they actually appear to have sort of fairly sort of reasonable status in, in the society. You know, sometimes they're highly skilled, mm. uh, they're silk weaver, salvage diver, um, a needle maker. So, so they have skills that, you know, and, and that sort of... Um, gives them some status in society. Yeah, definitely. So I, I spoke recently to um, one of the curators at the Mary Rose Trust and they were speaking about the di- the diver that you mentioned. I can't remember what his name was, but that it was an African uh, diver that, that salvaged, began to, well, they attempted to salvage the um, wreck of the Mary Rose. So that was really fascinating. Yeah, his name was Jacques Francis. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, and again, we know we know about him because he testifies um, in the High Court of Admiralty case um, brought against his master for stealing tin. His master was a, a Venetian called Peter Paolo Corsi. Um, so, so we get right into the nitty gritty of that. And you know, there were a lot of Italian merchants in Southampton at the time, and uh, they get into this big dispute. Um, so, so we hear Jacques Francis's sort of mediated voice in the in the court records, which is quite exciting yeah that is exciting so I recently Miranda watched a video of you on YouTube and you were discussing your book and in it you mentioned that whenever you tell people that you were studying Africans in in Tudor England they kind of automatically think that you were referring to slaves now you've touched on this a little bit can but can you talk to us about sort of slavery in Europe at this time and um, maybe go into a little bit more depth as to the legal status of the African Tudors? Yeah, so one of the key arguments in my book is that Africans were free in Tudor England. Yes. Uh, yes. I've mentioned a couple of the indicators of that, um, baptism, being mm-hmm. paid wages, being allowed to testify in court, uh, because you know, in other, in other societies where slavery does exist, um, enslaved people are not allowed to testify in court, for example. And there's also never any kind of statute law in England past sort of legalizing slavery uh, which which again like which does happen in other countries so in port in portugal you get some sort of 15th century legislation there there's sort of you know there's a clouded picture in some of the other countries but clearly uh in spain portugal and italy you have africans who are enslaved there and things are a bit different in northern europe partly because there's a much smaller uh, black population uh that france issues what it calls the code noir in the 17th century uh, but that's a bit later on um so so i think you know there is this clear difference and it's a, you know it's it's recognized by the people at the time as well so you get sort of spanish officials uh also um other you know africans themselves sort of commenting that uh, of the that africans are free in england and um you know so so for example um a man called Diogo, who's an African brought to England by a pirate um, in 1614. Uh, and he, he says, you know, that immediately when he set foot on English soil, he became free. And um, so, I mean, there were there were free Africans other in other places in Europe as well um, that had been manumitted mm-hmm. or sort of found their freedom. There were free people in other parts of Europe that had been manumitted um, and found their freedom. And again, sort of some of them reached some quite high statuses but but yeah but I, my argument is that, that in in England at least um and Scotland Af- Africans were free okay now you you mentioned that you found um evidence of over 360 individuals of African descent living in, in England during the Tudor reign and you focused on 10 people in your book could you tell us you've told us um, a little bit about a couple there could you tell us about a few of the other individuals that you um, came across. Yeah, uh, just to clarify, the 360 is up to 1640, so the early right, okay. uh, period as well. So about 200 of those are from the Tudor period. So let's see. Well, we start with John Blank, who's probably the most famous African Tudor, uh, mostly because there's a picture. There are two portraits of him in this sort of rather wonderful document called the Westminster Tournament Roll, which is a 60-foot-long vellum uh, painting, painting on vellum showing a tournament that Henry VIII put on in 1511 to celebrate the birth of a son who then died quite soon after. So we know John Blank. Um, so John Blank's portrait in the Westminster Tournament role is actually the, f- the only portrait we have of an African in Tudor England. And uh, so he played at that tournament. Uh, we think he probably came over with Catherine of Aragon in 1501. So he was playing at the court of Henry VII and then Henry VIII. He plays at Henry VII's funeral and then Henry VIII's coronation. 
And the only other thing we really know about him is that he got married in 1512 and Henry VIII sort of gives him a wedding present of some sort of fancy, fancy clothes to wear for his, on his wedding day. And then he sort of disappears from the record. Uh, we've talked about the salvage diver already. Yes. Uh, I love the story of Diego who um, circumnavigates the globe with Francis Drake uh, and also sort of uh, negotiates a key alliance for him with these maroons. So runaway, uh, formerly enslaved people who've created their own settlements in the hinterland in Panama. And Diego um, negotiates this uh, this alliance between um, them and Drake and they successfully capture a whole load of treasure from the Spaniards. And uh, I, I really like the story of uh, Dedere Jakawa as well, um, because he's a prince. Uh, he comes from River Sestos in modern day Liberia. Uh, so he's an example of what I was talking about before when some Africans come to London and learn English and then go mm. back again. So there's this quite funny scene in one of the letters from a, a merchant with the East India Company and he sort of lands at this port in modern Liberia and is very, very surprised when an African approaches him and is speaking English to him. And he just, he's like, what's that? <laughs> you. Uh, so that, that's quite um, interesting. And there were women as well in the book. Yes, um, I was just going to ask you, yeah, any women? Uh, yeah, no, well, there are, uh, there are, I think I've got three three chapters about three different women in the book. Uh, there was a fourth that hit the cutting room floor because technically she never actually set, set foot in England. Right. <laughs> Yeah, we had to sort of, well, I incorporated her into a different chapter. She was she was on Drake's circumnavigation voyage as well. So uh, if Drake's ship counts as English, as English, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, so uh, we've got I've got a chapter on Mary Phyllis who comes to London from Morocco, uh, and we have a sort of extended uh, record of her baptism at St Bottle Soulgate in 1597, uh, which sort of tells us quite a lot about her. Um, she she starts out working in a in a sort of fairly wealthy merchant's household in London, but then she ends up moving. You know, and she moves household not not when anyone dies, like you know, when her master or mistress dies or anything, but just a sort of some sort of given year. And so that sort of suggests to me that she had a choice about where mm. who she was going to work for. And she goes to work for somebody of sort of relatively low status, a seamstress called Millicent Porter, who lives in East Smithfield, so that's just outside the walls. Uh, of the city of London so it's a relatively poor area but this woman is a seamstress so my uh, sort of speculation is that Mary Phyllis wanted to learn a trade uh, and you know had the opportunity to learn the art of dressmaking uh, in Millicent Porter's household because Millicent Porter probably only had one or two servants uh, so she would have had to sort of pitch in and help with with the work so I think that that kind of puts her in a better, a better position. And then, you know, she's 20 by the time she gets baptised. So the question is, sort of why why is that? Because she arrived in London as a, as a girl, sort of six or seven. And again, I sort of speculate that maybe she wanted to get married. Because, of course, you have to be a baptised Christian to get married in the in the Church of England. And there's another, you know, another woman that I write about that people kind of seem to quite like um because she's so normal so ordinary like all we the only sort of strong the, all we really know about her is there's this inventory of what she owned at her death so she died without making a will but because she had a certain number of possessions that are worth more than uh, i think it was five pounds you had if you if you owned property more than five pounds at your death then uh, they would draw up an inventory right and assign you know someone to decide what to do with it really uh and so we learn from that that she's living in Armondsbury, which at the time was a small village outside of bristol it's now sort of been subsumed into the bristol suburbs uh and uh she you know she has a cow so her cow is her most valuable possession uh which which would mean that she you know she could um make a livelihood from that you know she could she obviously could enjoy the milk and butter and cream herself but then if she made enough she could sell that to others uh, i found a sort of later example from the 18th century where it sort of actually said that the officials would actually give if you were a poor woman looking for chap who needed support they would actually give you give you a cow right, you know, sort okay. of a, a benefit system yeah uh, if they gave you a cow, that would that would sort of really help help you along. So so yeah, so I was able to sort of um, sketch out a, a sort of sense of her life um, from from what she owns. So you got a sense of sort of 
uh, you know, she had pewter candlesticks or whatever. So you could kind of sketch out her, her life that way. People were thinking about um, diversity in the Tudor period. They would, you know, they would expect that diversity in London, perhaps, mm-hmm. but they wouldn't, you know, they don't, the idea of an African woman just sort of milking her cow on the village green <laughs> is a, is a, you know, it's, it's something that people really don't expect. Uh, and, she, you know, the, I found records of Africans in various sort of far-flung villages across the country, like Bluntisham cum Erith in Cambridgeshire or Haverley. And, <laughs> and you, people, yeah, people don't really, that's not really, it doesn't really fit with people's preconceptions. So uh, my book is all about smashing preconceptions. Yeah, I love it. That day I was going to ask you whether they were mainly in Tudor London or whether they had, you know, moved around and settled in other places. So that's that's really great information. Now, you've mentioned some of the sources that you've used to research the lives, um, like the court records and the inventories. Was there, What other sort of sources did you use to glean all this wonderful information? Yeah, so in terms of numbers, um, the most records are in parish registers. So those are records of baptisms, marials and burials. Uh, so that, that kind of gives us quite a lot of the numbers. But yeah. you know, yeah. apart from, you know, Mary Phyllis is an exception because there's sort of three or four pages describing her baptism. Uh, but usually you just kind of get one line like, you know, Mary, daughter of John, a blackamoor. Uh, and that's pretty much all that you get. Um, so, so it's sort of things like the court records that are a bit meatier. Uh, but I also looked at sort of ta- tax records. So there was a uh, alien poll tax. So anyone from a foreign country had to pay four pence in a, a ta- extra tax. Uh, so again, you, know, you get a few records that way. But again, they they tend to be these sort of one liners. Uh, there was a few wills, often where where the Africans were actually beneficiaries of the wills. So their their former masters were giving them uh, legacies, you know, small you know small legacies. Or I mean, one one woman gets ten pounds, quite right. a lot. That's just, quite a lot. Or, or sort of clothing, or sort of basic sort of yeah, you know, just just bits and pieces. So, but that's significant as well because if if these people were enslaved, the wills would be giving them to somebody else, whereas you know, the wills that we find, they are receiving legacies. Uh, and you, know, you can't, and in, enslaved people, you know, don't tend to own property themselves, you know. So, um, you know, that's where Catalina's inventory is, is significant as well as people uh, leaving them things. Uh, and what else? Uh, there's quite a lot of sort of letters that mention Africans, you know, in the state papers, the government papers, uh, there's discussion of... Um, Sometimes of Africans that have been brought uh, back to England by privateers, or you know, in a different sort of context, uh, information about the uh, Moroccan ambassadors that visited London in 1589 and 1600. Uh, so, so you just really kind of and became a sort of Jill of all trades. Um, you know, most quite often historians work with one set of archives, but I had to sort of spread myself more thinly and, and get to understand sort of more of a variety of, of different kinds of documents that survive. Yeah, now I imagine that there were many eye-opening moments for you during your research. Uh, what's something that you discovered that really surprised you? Yeah, well, I was saving this one up, so I didn't, I didn't mention <laughs> it uh, when, uh, when we were talking about some of the, the people. So the, the really, like, the most sort of shocking, really, or surprising moment was discovering uh, that an African called Edward Swarthy, who was working as a porter in another sort of rural village in Gloucestershire in, in a manor house uh, belonging to Sir Edward Winter. So this man, Edward Swarthy, was probably baptised after his master, Edward Winter, is commanded to whip a fellow servant called John Guy uh, in December 1596. So we have an African man whipping an Englishman a white Englishman, and that of all you know, of all the of all the scenes in my book, you know, that mm. is the paradigm shifting one because it's just it's not what we expect to the point that you know when I first found the testimony from a court case that described this scene, um, it, the handwriting at the time is you know is quite tricky sometimes to decipher, and when I first saw Edward Swarthy's testimony. I couldn't really make very many words out to start with them. But the first one that sort of jumped out at me was whip with a right. double P. Uh, and I was like, oh, God, a whipping. Right. And I, mm. I, you know, I immediately assumed that the African man would be being whipped. Uh, but actually, he was holding the cudgel. Uh, so, I, you know, I was as surprised as anybody else. Um, 
but I think that's a really important story to tell. Absolutely, yeah. Crazy, the crazy thing about it is that then John Guy, the one who gets whipped, uh, ends up becoming one of the first governors of Newfoundland. Oh, right. As well as like mayor of Bristol and an MP. Uh, and, and, you know, some, some Canadians wrote his, a biography of him a little while ago, but they just didn't know about this early episode in his life at all. So he sort of left it out and sort of assumed that he'd grown up in Bristol. Uh, so he was born in Bristol, but then he obviously ends up serving in this Gloucestershire household. Uh, not that far from Bristol, but um, quite a long journey at the time. Uh, and then returns to Britain. So, so the whipping, he gets sacked. He was in quite a high status position as the manager of the ironworks. But yeah, he gets sacked. Um, and at that point, he sort of goes back to Bristol and manages to sort of develop quite a prestigious career there. Wow, that is fascinating stuff and not what you'd expect at all. Um, I saw on, on Twitter that you've been working closely with some secondary schools, and you mentioned this a little earlier, to develop teaching resources to enable schools to teach their, you know, their kids about the lives of African tutors. Could you tell us a little bit more about this project and if any schools want to get involved, how they do that? Yeah, so I'm really excited about this because it, it really means a lot to me. And uh, I, I spoke uh, at a teaching conference run by the Historical Association last summer and you know it was great but um i afterwards i sort of tweeted and i said well you know are there any teachers out there who who'd like to help me kind of do something more substantial with this to get black tutors into the classroom and i had you know a, you know a really good response sort of 20 to 30 people or something came back to me quite quickly so uh, i got their email addresses started a mailing list and um, we did a workshop last September with a group of teachers. We all got together for the day and, and sort of threw ideas around. Uh, and some of the teachers who came along had already been teaching back to this. So, uh, we, and we've just sort of been working on that ever since. Some of these teachers have actually taught black tutors this, this academic year. Uh, and we came together again at a different teaching conference a couple of weeks ago. And some of them sort of presented what they'd been doing to, to other teachers. Uh, and I did a sort of big, uh, big speech myself, sort of barefacedly trying to uh, convert these teachers, <laughs> to, you know, to, to teach black tutors. Uh, and, and so we've, uh, we've already, some of these teachers have already um, uploaded their, their schemes of work and lessons plans to a Google Drive. Right. Uh, so you can find the link to that on my website. Um, there's a blog I wrote a little while ago called Teaching Black Tudors, uh, and there's a link on there. So if you Google Miranda Kaufman Teaching Black Tudors, it should all pop up. Uh, but, you know, we're carrying on to develop it. We're going to have another workshop this autumn, uh, and we're hoping to kind of polish those resources up and make them even more usable to any teacher out there, really. And it's not... I think one of our big things is we don't want it to be just sort of an add-on. So yes. I think a lot of people yes. already teach the Tudors, but ideally, they wouldn't just do kind of one lesson on the black tutors and then move on again to their usual mm. usual routine. But the uh, the stuff on the Google Drive has some examples of how how you can kind of um, incorporate uh, the black tutors sort of more generally to to all the other things that you're trying to teach. So again, um, some of the big themes: so religion, um, the relationship with Spain, uh, or, you know, all of these things uh, can can be to all, all sorts of uh, people talk. Of, one of the things they're meant to teach, I think, is. Um, rural lifestyles you know the fact that the majority of Tudors were living in villages and having you know quite quiet lives in the country uh, so we could use sort of Catalina to talk about that and I think it does it does give give the children sort of something new and exciting to think about and uh, I mean one of the things I wasn't expecting is an English teacher was very passionate about getting involved and she uh, in my book, um, each chapter starts with a sort of short paragraph imagining a key moment in the individual's life, uh, and she's uh, she's given her kids uh, those some of those paragraphs and asked them to continue telling the story in their own words. Oh, that's fantastic! So it's really great. She shared some of the things they'd written, and it was just amazing. So I, yeah, I'm just blown away by um, where where it's all gone, really. Yeah, but it's just great. 
That's fantastic. And I'll, I'll add the link to the um, Teaching Black Tutors post and to your website, then people can find it really easily if they'd like to get involved with that. So Miranda, it's time to play our little game to, of 10 to go. That That's the way we finish all <laughs> our episodes. So just 10, not difficult questions at all, just to get to know you a little bit better. So are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Excellent. So what's a favourite or most inspirational place to visit that's close to home for you? Oh, close to home. <laughs> <laughs> I live, I live in North Wales. Um, well, there's loads of great castles around here. Yeah, that would be. Um, but I, I suppose a sort of special place that people don't really know about is uh, somewhere called Gladstone's Library. And it's only about 10 minutes from me in a village called Harden. And so Prime Minister Gladstone, William Gladstone, uh, had a load of books. <laughs> As he, during his career, he collected a lot of books. And when he died, um, you know, his family you know, weren't quite sure what to do with them all. Uh, and they actually sort of built a purpose-built library to hold them all. And, you know, and it's got a sort of re traditional reading room there, which uh, reminds me of sort of the kind of libraries I found uh, as a student in Oxford. Uh, and, it, you know, they've built the collection from there. Um, you know, you with the same sort of subject areas as William Gladstone was particularly interested in, like sort of theology, but also history. And it's a very quiet and kind of meditative place to, to work. Um, I don't go there as often as I'd like to, but it, yeah, it's quite special. It's also the only residential library in the UK. So you can actually go and stay there. And they do offer scholarships. Um, so you can, if you if you win the scholarship, you can go and stay there for free uh, for a week or two. And I'm actually in the process of um, developing a Black British History scholarship with them there. So that would be great. Watch the space. Yeah, fantastic. All right, favorite comfort food. Ooh, I like so much different food. <laughs> <laughs> I think if it's really comfort, I think, you know, just toast and butter. Uh, there's some really yeah. great bread. There's a bakery near here called Gerard's and they make this amazing kind of brown seeded loaf, which is so good that I find it difficult to eat other breads. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, toast a bit of that, have some butter, a cup of tea. Yeah, that, if it's really comfort, you know, it, I think if you need comfort, you definitely can't be bothered to actually cook anything. No, that's true. <laughs> so true so, unless someone else cooks it yep <laughs> very yeah, true absolutely basic. I, I mean I am I do like cooking I make all sorts of things um people like my white chocolate chip brownies oh yeah but, that sounds good uh, yeah I made I successfully made some ice cream for the first time a couple Ooh. of weeks ago um I got a recipe from a magazine and it had rose petals and raspberries oh wow <laughs> that, that sounds so, really that went down well. the family devoured it in about 10 minutes <laughs> well that's a good sign <laughs> very good all right what uh, was the last book that you bought oh gosh uh i buy so many books i can imagine i can imagine i thought i think i don't know what's it called i'm, I'm reaching for my bag uh <laughs> i was just in i was just in scotland for a conference and i had so i got lots of reading suggestions uh right well, this is a, yeah there's one out right here called the reaper's garden Ooh. Death and Power in the World of Atlantic Slavery by Vincent Brown. Going to Jamaica uh, in just over a week. So, yeah, I saw uh, that. That's exciting. Need to, do, need to do some preparatory reading. Yeah, that is so exciting. How long are you going for? Um, I'm only going to be in Jamaica for about a week. Okay. Um, but it's part of a trip. I'm going to Virginia as well to give a, a lecture there because it's um, 400 years since the first Africans arrived right. in Jamestown, Virginia. Well, they arrived at Point Comfort, uh, and local historians are very keen to point out that they didn't arrive in Jamestown. Right. When they first met. But it's very, you know, it is significant to people, you know, where, what spot exactly did these first Africans set foot on, on Virginian soil? Of course, in my book, uh, I show that they weren't actually, you know, we know that they weren't the first Africans to set foot in modern day North America. Um, the Spaniards, you know, the part of the parts of sort of the American South that were Spanish at some point, um, mm. Africans were with them in the sort of 1520s, 1530s. And then Diego, who's sailing with uh, Francis Drake, sort of touches off California for a couple of weeks in right. 1579. Right. But but these ones in Virginia are, are the most significant because they become permanent settlers there. So I, I'm sort of going to be providing some context to that Um you know, in that very same year, 1619, one of the chapters I wrote about John Anthony, who was a sailor 
Uh, and he actually set sail on a voyage to Virginia in that very same year. Uh, and if he had got there, uh, he would have been the first African in Virginia and he would have been a free wage sailor. So that would have been a different kind of story. Um, but unfortunately, his voyage sort of only gets as far as Bermuda uh, because then they get hold of some tobacco and sail sail back right, to Europe. Okay. So, so they don't they don't go all the way to Virginia in the end. But it's still an interesting contrast, you know, that men like him were operating in the Atlantic world at that period, uh, even though the first Africans in Virginia get sort of traded for victuals or, or food. Mm. Uh, so they obviously have a different status. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah, and, you know, I'll be in Jamaica researching for my next book. So fantastic yes so Miranda I don't know if you watch a lot of television because you're a very busy lady but name a show that you've either binge watched or maybe a movie that you kind of go back to that I go back to I love watching telly I watch all sorts of rubbish (laughs) good when I get the chance you do you do need well I I actually ended up watching Pitch Perfect oh did you have from my (laughs) conference (laughs) <laughs> Although unfortunately I was, you know, because I'm sort of hypersensitive to this thing, I did notice some pretty racist jokes and right, de- yeah. dubious racial stereotyping in Pitch Perfect. So it's hard for me to enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now I suppose my sort of, comf- if my, my equivalent of sort of buttered toast is probably, uh, oh, it's difficult. I love uh, the old Robin Hood with Errol Flynn. Right. I yes. think he's pretty pretty sexy although he turned out to be a complete bastard in real life are you allowed to say that word you can say that word yeah we can say. <laughs> he turned out to, yeah he well he actually spent some time in jamaica but was very naughty while he was there mm-hmm. uh but also uh so i love that in fact you know i used the soundtrack from that on my wedding video oh did you <laughs> but uh it, no it's good it's got a lot of kind of procession music in it and feasting music so it works quite yeah well. that's good uh, but then there's uh, yeah, the other one i love is the princess bride um i could watch that you know i've watched that a lot <laughs> do you know what i mean the princess bride? i don't know that i've seen her no oh, you must it's it's a sort of comic fairy tale it's I'm difficult writing it to down the princess uh, bride the princess bride uh it sort of starts out with fred savage who you might know from the oh Wonder yes years. from the Wonder years i loved that he's a, little, he's a little boy and he's stuck in bed because he's ill He's bored and his grandfather comes round to entertain him. And he's like, oh, I'd rather play my computer games. Uh, his, his grandfather says, I'm going to read you a story. And he, you know, he's very sceptical. Mm-hmm. Uh, but his grandfather turns out to be a master, masterful storyteller. And it's, you know, it's got everything. It's got princesses. It's oh, got that gi- sounds giants, great. It's court church, and it's got true love. Oh. Uh, that's what um, <laughs> I'm going to watch it. I'm adding it to my list. Very good. Some very good, like, one-liners or memorable quotes. So there's a Spanish guy who's trying to avenge his father and he's trying to find the six-fingered man who Mm -hmm. killed him uh, when he was a boy. And his line is, my name is Inigo Montoya. You (laughs) killed my father. Prepare to die. Uh, (laughs) And he just keeps on repeating that phrase while he's having this sword fight with the six-fingered man. Anyway, it gives you a flavour. You must watch it. Yes, I like it. I think I'm going to really enjoy that. All right. Are you superstitious? Uh, no. No, No, you don't mind walking under ladders. You don't mind black cats. You don't mind any of that. No, not that. I suppose, but I sometimes sort of feel like something was meant to be or that, I don't know, just very blessed when yes. something kind of special happens or I suppose I have a feeling for place so yes maybe as a historian you know there are some places where you visit where you sort of feel I don't know connected to the people who lived there in the past oh yeah I you feel that. like you know you're only usually you're removed from the past by time and space but if you go to the right space then it's just time that separates you absolutely that's um yeah exactly how I feel actually um I can see that lots of things bring you joy, but what's something that, um, you know, brings you lots of joy, makes you really happy? Oh, well, my the sound of my daughter's laughter. Aww. Daughters, plural. And, yeah, yeah, two daughters, yes. <laughs> two daughters. Oh, that's beautiful. But, yeah. well, and when they give each other hugs, you know. Yeah, that's cute, isn't it? When that's they get sweet. along, that's always that's nice. Sweet, 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 sweet. Yeah. Um, and... Quite thoughtful to each other. Oh, well, that's lovely. That's really nice. 
Uh, I think I might know what you're going to say to this one, but I'll ask you anyway. <laughs> Name something that you're currently looking forward to. Maybe it's Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm actually a bit, um, I'm a bit nervous because I think it's just going to be boiling hot. Oh, yeah, uh, I probably will. I'm, a bit, not, I'm, I'm probably more looking forward to coming home. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm I'm really looking for, I am looking forward to it because I think it's going to be really fascinating and stimulating and you know to be able to visit some of these spaces again although obviously the history I'm going to be investigating is quite um traumatic. Yes, yeah. Uh, so so that's well but it's definitely going to be interesting. Absolutely. And you mentioned a new book, can you share what your new project is? Yeah, so it's called Heiresses slavery and the caribbean marriage trade fantastic uh, and when's that one due out uh oh not till at least 2022 okay so i have to actually you know research and write <laughs> research. <laughs> yeah the fun part exactly fabulous all right lucky last if you could have a superpower what superpower would you like to have and why well one might say time travel oh, is a yes. thing, but <laughs> on the other hand i think being a woman in pretty much any other time period yes, would be a bit of a nightmare so i think i'd like to be able to fly yep. i used to have dreams yeah. about flying i think everyone would like to be able to fly yeah, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? And I've dreamt about flying as well, which is, I've flown in dreams and it's such a strange feeling. And then you wake up and you're like, <laughs> I can't fly anymore. Damn. <laughs> so sad. Well, there's one last thing that we do on Talking Tutors, Miranda. We always end with a tutor takeaway. So our guest shares something for the listeners to go and have a look at. It might be a film, it might be listen to a song or read a book or do you have a tutor takeaway for us? Oh, well, I definitely do. It's a yeah. very easy question, this one. You must all go and watch Six the Musical. Oh, yes. Have you heard about this? I've heard about that. People have been just yeah, <laughs> raving about it. It's amazing. I know all the words now. I've seen it four times live and I have, have the soundtrack on my phone. <laughs> it's my happy music. You know, whenever I'm a bit annoyed by anything, I just uh, play that and sing along and I'm happy again. Wow. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a song contest. <laughs> It combines some of the things I love, you know, like Britain's Got Talent, The X Factor, <laughs> and Tudor History. And so, Tudor History. So, <laughs> in order of preference, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's the six wives of Henry VIII, and they're having a singing competition to decide which of them has had the worst deal from Henry VIII. <laughs> uh, so they all sing a song. Uh, it, there's just great banter. The lyrics are hilarious. Uh, you know, and there is some real history in there. So I just love it. And the costumes and the music, they, they, it's sort of like punk Tudor that they're yeah. wearing. Yeah. Oh, it, you know, roughs, but also kind of stud, you know, silver studs and uh, oh, it. It, yeah, fish net tights. You know, it, oh, it's just, it, I love it. I love it. I, I, I'm going to have to go and watch it again. They've started doing sing-along performances. So. Oh, that's so fun. <laughs> that my next treat, hopefully. Oh, that's fantastic. And do you know what? I have it on good authority for all my Australian listeners that there is an Australian show in production. I don't know oh, any of the details it? yet, but I'm I'm waiting and I'm hoping that they're going to come to Sydney. I've got my fingers and toes crossed that there will be a show yeah. here. So, yeah, watch this space as well because that will be awesome. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, because, I mean, it was written by these students. And when they were still students, they took it to yeah. Edinburgh Festival and it sort of ballooned from there and it's on the West End and I think there's a production just starting in Chicago. So hopefully it will tour the world. Yes, amazing stuff. Well, I would also highly recommend a new uh, novel by Kate Morrison called A Book of Secrets, uh, which I had the pleasure to read twice in, in development. Uh, it's fantastic. So it's got a black Tudor heroine called Susan. She grows up in the countryside. She's a black Tudor, but... Um, she uh, grows up in a Catholic household, which causes problems, uh, and she ends up having to leave that household and move to London, where she marries a printer, but he is Catholic too, so they've got a whole kind of surreptitious printing operation going on you know, behind the official one, uh, and that also leaves, leads her into a lot of intrigue, uh, and obviously there's drama, romance, uh, spying, uh, and it's just it's just great, and because it, it brings that sort of diverse Tudor London to life um, in a sort of adventurous and exciting way. You know, she meets people from Portugal, other Africans. Uh, you know, lots lots going on. Uh, so I'd highly recommend reading that. 
That sounds brilliant. Thank you. Well, Miranda, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. You've got so much going on and I'm so grateful that you made time to chat with us and talk about your amazing work. And I can't wait to hear all about your trip and your next book. Great. Thanks. Well, it's been great chatting. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you will also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family and click on the all important follow button so you'll never miss an episode. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to Talking Tudors with you again very soon. Thank you.